Hello, Anu. It's good to see you again. Hi, Ron. Great to see you. All right. Um, now that we got the formalities out of the way, I'm going to... Uh, I've known you for a long time, and I've kind of followed your work, and I've really appreciated it, and I know that it's multi-layered. So I don't want to look stupid or sound stupid, and I would just love for you to kind of, for me and for everyone, all 10 of the people watching, um, tell me about yourself. Who is Anu? Where do you want me to start? Wherever you think it's most relevant. I think you're interesting from start to finish. Um, I think um, to understand my work, one also needs to understand some of my background. Okay. And um, part of that was that I was born in England mm -hmm. and spent nearly over 10 years of my life there before I moved to India. Or my parents moved me to India. Okay. And so uh, those were formative years. Mm -hmm. And um, I lived in India for nearly 18 years. Okay. Nearly 20 years. So you were, you lived in England until you were 10. Mm -hmm. I was and, born in England. Okay. Yeah. What, what London or? A small little town called Starport on Seven. Okay. And my father was a dentist there. And um, yeah, it was very nice. Okay. Um, then I, they moved back to India mm -hmm. and they promised me an elephant, which I never got. But uh, that's how they bribed my brother and me to okay. move. All right. And I lived in India for nearly 20 years. And uh, my father died about two years after reaching India. Mm -hmm. And so those years were very, you know, formative. Mm -hmm. But also as a woman, having experienced equality in England coming mm -hmm. to India, which is a much more patriarchal society, mm -hmm. really influenced who and what I've become. Okay. I think about, you know, when I think about England, I think, you know, obviously colonialism and the India-England relationship is fraught. So you're from Indian parents and you move back to India from England, kind of almost like a reverse Oh, what is that? Migration? Reverse immigration? Yeah, yeah reverse yeah. migration. How did that kind of... I mean, I know you were only 10 years old, so it's not like you were aware of the world. It probably was just India was this beautiful country that has colors and people look like you and so on and so forth. But was there something about that you that kind of made you aware of a sense of other, if that makes sense? Um, absolutely. I mean... Um I had a different accent, which mm -hmm. uh, you know, school children can be very cruel. Mm -hmm. So I got teased mercilessly about that. I okay. didn't actually know an Indian language, mm -hmm. so I only knew English. And so that was also a big difference. Mm -hmm. And apparently even the way I walk is different than um, other Indian children. Mm -hmm. So The way you walk? Yes. I don't ask my brother. He would always point it out. Jeez. That's rough. I mean, you're right. Kids can, kids are cruel, I think, because there's always, I mean, growing up and especially I, I moved um, to a different town when I was 10 as well. And there's just, there's something about that period where it's just really, it's a very formative year or age. Um, you're just kind of getting used to being a kid. And then all of a sudden, a whole other deck of cards comes down the pike. So when did you discover photography? My undergraduate was in mathematics. Okay. And the only good thing, and I chose it for all the wrong reasons. All right. What were those bad reasons? Uh, <laughs> in my, over there, we call it 12th standard. That's okay. the, you know, the grade in high school before you go to college. Mm -hmm. My teacher challenged me saying I was going to fail in math. And uh, we have what we call a study holidays where we have 10 days before the exam to kind of cram everything. Mm -hmm. So I crammed and I got something like 96%. And I thought, wow, this is easy. I don't have to study the whole semester and I can just wait till the, the last minute to study and do well in my undergraduate uh, degree. Mm -hmm. And so that was the reason I chose math. Isn't that amazing? Is that spite? I don't know what it would, <laughs> but the, yeah, that is interesting. You know? <laughs> and so you, you got this degree in math and then what happened? Well, when I got this degree in math, one of the things about India is when you choose your major, you can't change it. Mm -hmm. And I, after the first year, I knew I had made a mistake, mm -hmm. but I was stuck with that degree, doing, finishing that degree. 
Uh, but the only good thing about the college I went to is we had one optional subject a year. And I got into a photography class through the physics department. Okay. And because photography is connected to science. Oh, totally. And uh, seeing that image come up in the developer, I just fell in love with photography. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing, thinking about it now, uh, because I also teach photography, is that our class of about 15 students had one camera, two rolls of film for the whole semester. So I was only able to photograph two frames. <laughs> Okay, how did how did you learn photography with one kit with two frames? Uh, we did photograms. Okay. Uh, we had to since we knew we only ha could photograph two images. You really had to think about the composition, think mm -hmm. about the light, um, and pre-plan it. I guess mm -hmm. uh, uh, than now how we photograph with cell phones. Uh, yeah, you finish college you know you're not going to be i mean what are the mathematician jobs out there i mean they're uh, out there oh uh, you have to i mean uh you have to go into mo most people get a graduate degree or mm -hmm. a phd okay there was no way i was going to do yeah. that so you you're in love with photography with your one camera and two frames your two pictures <laughs> you know uh -huh. what happened after that i got a job at a computer company and worked there for six years. Wow. And by the end of it, I hated getting up in the morning. Fair. That makes sense. So you're, I'm just trying to figure out, you do graduate college when you were 21, 22? So you're 21 or so, then you get a job in the computer company. And so 27 years old, 28, hating life. Were you taking pictures during this time or was like, I was taking pictures in my mind. Okay. In my head. All right. Yeah. And then an ex-boyfriend said, instead of complaining and whining all the time, why don't you do what you really want to do? And I sat down and thought about it. It was photography. Okay. So all right. I applied for, I applied to come to the U.S. for uh, to do either photography or get an MBA. Uh -huh. If photography didn't work out, I was going to get an MBA. All right. All right. So you and you went to a, a University of Delaware. Is that yeah, correct? For okay. my master's, yeah. Okay. So you got an MFA, but did you have a photography portfolio or a, what, what did that look like? I mean, it's just different time. I know. What I actually did is I came to Philadelphia and I went and got a associate's degree in photography. Okay. And so they taught me the technical aspects mm -hmm. and, um, and I had some fantastic teachers who helped me get into Delaware. You're, you know, you, you get the associate's degree in photography and that ha gives you the technical stuff. Was that kind of like, I mean, I, I would, the image I have in my head is almost like a dry sponge just being dropped in water. Was it like, oh my God, did you feel, talk, how did that feel to kind of be in this dead end, I hate my job, to this is everything I love? Um, I knew I wasn't going to get an MBA. This is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But the reality of how to make a living was really weighing on me. Okay. So then you go to Delaware and get an MFA. Mm -hmm. All right. In photography. In photography. That obviously must have been a very, I mean, you, you obviously knew how to work. You, you're not dumb. You can do all this stuff. When did you start thinking, were you taking the pictures or exploring the ideas that your current work is exploring now, then, or what were you, what was that kind of creative journey? My master's degree experience was miserable. Okay. <laughs> Talk more about that. And, um, frankly, the professors didn't understand where I was coming from or didn't know where to point me to look at work that resonated with what I wanted to do. What did you want to do that they wouldn't let you do? Well, initially I thought I wanted to be a photojournalist, okay. but my work isn't very photojournalistic. No. And um, uh, so that didn't work. But in terms of, for example, exploring my memories of my cultural homeland, mm -hmm. Um, that I started that in the last semester of grad school, but that was after I, it was like, fuck you to all my professors and mm -hmm. that I'm going to do what I want to do. Okay. Um, but all the other work that I had brought up for crits was completely rejected and they were forcing me to do things 
uh, very stereotypical thing, portraits in India mm -hmm. or using the American flag, which I didn't want to do. Yeah. And um, so, yes, it was not a very good experience. Did it make you a better photographer? I'm not trying to put a positive spin on it, but it was, I mean, there, there's something about that, like, you know, I'm tired of eating shit and I'm just going to shove it down your throat and you've never looked back. I'm going to say, I'm going to give you that one. You've never, you, you know, this is the big fuck you. And that's that. Uh, there were positive things. One is I got screwed over for getting a teaching assistantship, mm -hmm. but that forced me to get other teaching experience outside of graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I taught at ICP, at Bucks okay. uh, Community College and mm -hmm. some other community colleges. And so when I applied for my current job, I had teaching experience outside of a graduate mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. That was huge. Mm -hmm. um, the other things I learned was not to be that kind of teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, and what also happened afterwards is that I went to Anderson Ranch mm -hmm. Artist Residency yep. and I got a fellowship for that and I met people there who opened my world okay. to other artists, other ways of doing things and it made me, I guess, appreciate mm -hmm. uh, what, I w what I was then being um, exposed to. Who was someone that really influenced you there? Um, there was um, a artist called Monica Chow. Okay. Um, there was a photographer called Bill Thomas. He was in charge of the photo section. Mm -hmm. When I was at Anderson Ranch, I actually got the interview, um, you know, the call for the interview at the University of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And there were two or three people there who'd gone through the process of interviewing, mm -hmm. even though they'd never gotten tenure or yeah. rejected the tenured position. So they literally trained me for my interview. Oh, I wouldn't have gotten my job without mm -hmm. some of the support I got from them. There was another Indian art artist, ceramic artist called Vin Vineeth Kaka. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to take all my feminist uh, ranting and raving about Indian culture mm -hmm. and uh, help me kind of digest that and manage it in a more um, digestible way. Mm -hmm. So there were a number of people that, that had a big influence early on. Okay. So I mentioned that I thought I wanted to be a photojournalist. Yes. And I saw this photo story in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, it was a light study on 30th Street Station in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I loved the work and I looked up the photographer and thought, oh my God, this is amazing. This mm -hmm. is the kind of work I want to do. Mm -hmm. And there so happened to be an assistantship job at um, an art center up in New Jersey called okay. Peters Valley. Okay. And so I applied for the position and I got it. And that's how I met David Wells, who's now my husband. He's and, a keeper. And the joke is that I took his job and he stayed on for free rent. Hmm. Well, fair. But, um, but through working with him and doing projects on the side, mm -hmm. that's when I knew I couldn't be a photojournalist. Yeah. But I was very interested in socio-political mm -hmm. concepts. And so now I do that work in a way that's more conducive to my kind of personality because mm -hmm. I'm not as extroverted in yeah. that way. Um, but still maintain that, um, you know, that rootedness to what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. You're, I mean, I would say when I think about your work and I was thinking about, you know, when you're talking about being in graduate school and why don't you take pictures of like Indian portraits? I, I think kind of like that. Oh, you're from India. You must use color. Uh -huh. you, know, you must have color photography because it's so colorful over there. Kind of like make us some National Geographic pictures uh -huh. because your name's a new. Um, but that's not really your work. Your work, and when I think about your work, I think of it as kind of being subversive because it's like, oh, it's very familiar, but then there's this other hidden current to it. And so kind of talk about your process in what you do, what you're doing. We're going to have some examples of it mm -hmm. on the video, but just for the people who don't have televisions, uh -huh. like describe some of the work that you do and how you go about making it. So I started as a still photographer. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, I have a background in mathematics and mm -hmm. I didn't want to get bogged down by the technicalities of photography mm -hmm. and a view camera and mm -hmm. uh, everything that you do. Yes. <laughs> so I chose to go the other extreme and started photographing with a Holger, which is a $20 toy camera, yep. plastic toy camera, which 
has very few settings, one shutter speed and two f-stops. Mm -hmm. But with my background in the sciences, I understand how to get good exposure mm -hmm. and modify development to get that good negative. Mm -hmm. So I photographed uh, my memories of India, going back to my cultural homeland every year, okay. and photographing the gestures, the sounds, the sounds that r uh, remind me of my home culture, mm -hmm. but that I've also chosen to leave. Okay. And I did that for over 20 years. All right. Um, and then in parallel to that, I, the first project, I mean, I wouldn't be the first project, but one that I would mention is that because I have this amalgamation of accents, mm -hmm. people often ask me where I'm from. And if I say Rhode Island, no one hmm. believes me. <laughs> and so when I say that I'm an Indian, I often have to clarify that I'm an Indian from India. Mm -hmm. It was at the same time that I read a book by Ronald Takaki called um, A Different Mirror, mm -hmm. which is about the different histories of different ethnicities in the United States, but mm -hmm. through their lens. Mm -hmm. And that book had a huge impact on me. And I started researching the history of the indigenous. Mm -hmm. And as I looked at a lot of photographs, there's a lot of parallels between the history of photography of the indigenous with the history of photography that was going on by the British in mm -hmm. India. And so I, um, what I've started doing is take um, from the 19th century photograph often by Edward Curtis, who's mm -hmm. one of the most well-known photographers yeah. of the Native Americans. I pair them with self-portraits, mm -hmm. and the text uses humor to make the viewer rethink their assumptions about those outside of the mm -hmm. dominant culture. And so, you know, and one of the reasons both of us are called Indians is because Christopher Columbus got lost looking for India, but found North America instead, and he's the one who's created all this confusion. Hmm. That son of a bitch. <laughs> so I, um, yeah, so the work uses humor to make mm -hmm. people reassess some of their assumptions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now when you, it's very, it's, I don't think it's ever been irrelevant, um, but it seems more and more in the world that we're living in now that it's, it's really important to kind of see this work and to have this work out there. Um, are there people that are kind of doing similar things that are influencing you now? I mean, where are you getting your ideas? You know, in the in the, are you, I assume you're still making work. Yes, I am. And yes. is it you know sometimes it's like, well, is this row? Is there more to that kind of going back to the vintage? you know, or the ant antiquarian library, if you will, and having a contemporary spin put on it. Are you still, is that still working or where, what's the next, we're, we're now kind of in the today, what's tomorrow look like? Where, where, where are you, where's your lens pointing? Well, one of the, you know, when you look at my larger work, one of the things you'll notice is that um, I start with images that are either part of popular culture mm -hmm or our family photographs so that it, the work becomes more accessible by any audience beyond yeah. people who go to a museum or gallery. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that's one of the reasons I've been using the family photograph more recently, mm -hmm. more and more. For the last six years, I mean, it's a long path, but for the last six years, I've been working on, um, or let me reverse it and ask you a question. Okay. How many Indians do you think fought in World War II? Probably more than are counted, which is a good dodge. Um, 20,000. So it was two and a half million. Okay. See? So I was stunned to learn that two and a half million Indians fought in World War II and are not recognized in South Asia, let alone globally. Mm -hmm. And it led me down this path where now I've done some work in Italy where they were part of the Battle of Monte Cassino, mm -hmm. which was critical for winning World War II. Mm -hmm. And more recently, on a Fulbright, I went around India collecting family photographs of these soldiers. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, these family photographs, I then made 3D crystals, laser-cut crystals of. Okay. And in the space are is video archival video edited from World War II mm -hmm. uh, with the soundscape of the stories of the complicated history of these Indian soldiers. Okay. And, uh, and that was the latest work. And when I was collecting these stories, I came across 
at least five or, no, or more stories of Indian soldiers who were prisoners of war in Italy. Mm -hmm. And when um, the Italians signed the armistice and switched sides, a lot of the soldiers escaped from these prisoners of war camps mm -hmm. before the German soldiers came to take them over. Mm -hmm. And Italian families sheltered a number of soldiers, not only Indian, mm -hmm. uh, n a number of these sh uh, soldiers at the risk of their own lives until the war was over. Mm -hmm. And so in about two weeks, I'm leaving for Italy to on this wild goose chase to find some of the descendants of these Italian, fam Italian families. I'm hoping to scan their family photographs and create an installation with that work. It's interesting how the work has kind of gone... I won't say from the personal, but, but you're not inserting your, yourself into the work anymore. It's kind of like I'm telling other. So in, in some ways, it's almost like modern photojournalism or photo editorialism, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but and using photography is almost like the jumping off point. Exactly. And you're not. It's not about, you know, nice framed pictures. It's about objects because that was the question I saw. You know, when I was doing my research at 4D. That's 4D, four dimensions. Or is it supposed to be 3D? And they just put four to be clever. That was a class I taught. Where did you see 4D? It was, um, I think, either on your website or on the URI. I think it was on the URI. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What is that? I mean, fourth dimension. Yeah, we're changing the name of that class because no one knows what 4D is. But okay. it's basically, um, uh, you know, animation. Okay. Uh, and adding sound, okay. going beyond just uh, two-dimensional sculpture okay. to adding sound installation, projection. Photography has obviously changed since we we both started. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I grew up... I, I am actually going through my parents' photo archive of all Kodachrome slides, mm -hmm. which is really wild to mm -hmm. see, like, my parents' wedding back in the early 60s. Uh, my my dad when he was 12, you know, in on vacation. And just how this kind of family story, because it's Kodachrome, it hasn't faded. Um, I don't necessarily, I, I'm kind of in the middle of it, so I'm not really, like, getting a whole lot out of it because I'm just in process. But it is interesting how, it, and it maybe, and I'm, I'm trying to draw a thread here, but the family photos that you're scanning, they were made at a time when photography wasn't necessarily about anything, but it, it, it was more aspirational mm. in, mm -hmm. in some sense. You know, that it was like, this is not who we are as we are, but this is who we hope to be. Uh, are you seeing that in some of the old, it, like how, how are you kind of reconciling what you're, I don't know what you're necessarily trying to say, um, and you can answer that, but kind of using the material as it is that has that kind of aspiration. Um, and there's kind of a, a curated story to the pictures. Are you seeing that or am I making that up? Am I projecting something that doesn't exist? I actually believe that photography does lie, that it isn't the truth. Okay. And just showing a photograph is uh, can be misleading. Mm -hmm. So that's why my work has moved more into, I would say, experiential installations, okay. which do include the sound mm -hmm. and audio mm -hmm. to give context to those stories. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we, that, that makes sense. It's... It would almost be like when, you know, I don't know if you, when you were growing up, did your family have slideshows where they just like, oh, we went to Pismo Beach and or wherever, you know, and here we are and there's a new with the dolphin and there's a new, you know, eating tacos or whatever. Because that's what we, we would have. And, and mm -hmm. I just, that's something I've been thinking about is that like photography when I was growing up always had that audio. It wasn't just looking at a stack of pictures. It was a social thing. Mm, it was storytelling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was it supported something else. The work that you were doing earlier about immigration or just the way people were presented in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, especially people of color, you know, in the or Native Americans or Indians in America and Indians. Because you're right, the colonial, you know, British in India were not really nice people. Um, and kind of trying to reconcile those two experiences. But I'm sure it's like, that's the thing. Like your work on the surface is really simple, but there's a lot of complicated math to it. 
I, I think my work, what I want people to take away from my work is a change of perception. Okay. I want to change perceptions. I want people to walk away and say, I learned something new. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I want to do that in a in a way that doesn't hit people over the head. Yeah. My earlier work called Bollywood Satirize, which is about my feminist experience growing up in India, mm -hmm. uh, hits you over the head, yeah. yells at you and tells you yeah. what my experience is. And I... And I, I want, would like to be a little more subtle, yeah. and, but to uh, get a message across. It doesn't hit you over the head. It's really subtle. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it, sublime, perhaps, is the, a better term. And almost, I don't want to say easy to overlook, but it's quiet. Exactly. But there's a lot going on there. It's not Instagrammable. No. No, mm -hmm. that, that, that is something. You, you look at it, and you think, okay... And you, you have to kind of sit with it. So talk more about the, the project that you're working on now and kind of reconciling. It, is it just World War II or is it? I mean, what I'm working on now is directly connected to World War II. Okay. But why these soldiers are not remembered is uh, connected to colonial history. Okay. Because it becomes complicated. I mean, you spoke about all the British being bad in, Eng in India. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that... Um, one of my family's very close friends was a brigadier for the British Army mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. um, there are intertwining connections between the, what the British kind of left over in India and how that plays out itself in contemporary mm -hmm. life in India. So it's, a, it's complicated. Yes. And the fact is, is these Indian soldiers came back to India just as India was getting independence mm -hmm. from the British. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't want to be... Um, the Indians wanting independence didn't want these soldiers to be recognized in any way because they were fighting for what they considered as the enemy. Mm -hmm. but, but at the same time, if they hadn't fought, which side would have won World War II and yeah. where would we be today? And so all I'm asking is that their stories be acknowledged. Yeah. I'm not asking for any erasure of anything else, but mm -hmm. just for their stories to be acknowledged. And so what is, what does your family think about all this? Um, I think, I mean, my family has always been supportive yeah. of me. Your mom's great. I remember meeting Yeah, my mom's actually in town. I sent her out of the house because I didn't <laughs> want her to be here while fair. this was going on. Fair, fair. Uh, but they have always been, my media family's always been supportive of mm -hmm. My photography, they have, I, I think they had no idea what I do. Mm -hmm. When I became a professor, I became, um, you know, respectable. Uh, it's easier to, oh, uh, she's, a, she's a professor. Yes. Uh, but I think, you know, having now seen some of my shows, mm -hmm. they really understand what I'm doing and they actually help me make some of the connections when I'm in India okay. to some of these communities that I'm working with. All right. How has teaching, and I know you haven't just taught photography, but how are people, uh, you know, I, cause I know when I was teaching it, it, the way they were kind of accessing information and the way they were kind of digesting it changed. And I want to mm -hmm. kind of hear your experience about that. Sure. I mean, I started teaching darkroom photography mm -hmm. where you're really having to teach a lot of the technique. Mm -hmm. uh, our fine arts center has a lot of, um, uh, mold and as a result I have health problems in that building and I can't teach anymore there okay. so I shifted to digital about uh, eight years ago mm -hmm. and the wonderful thing is that it also changed my teaching mm -hmm. I mean what I've loved is that you know I've been teaching for 20 plus years but it hasn't become boring yeah because every year there's new things the you know photography keeps changing especially digital yeah. And one of the things I've learned is that uh, if a student wants to learn a technique or a software, they can just Google it. Yeah. So my job is to really make them become, ha convey the concepts they want through the visuals mm -hmm. and provide them the directions to find the techniques to make that possible. Mm -hmm. And so it has changed the teaching, but it's also changed the dynamic. Mm -hmm. Instead of me standing and lecturing yeah. it's more become you know we have an idea they do some research online and we come back together mm -hmm. and share that information or if i say something there'll be a question i don't know the answer of. they'll take out their phones and google yeah. it and so it's become much more interactive mm -hmm. does that ever intimidate you i know i mean i had to get used to that 
yeah, I had to get used to that. I luckily had a stepdaughter who was in college mm-hmm. at that at that time, mm-hmm. and so I'd ask her for advice, and then she would kind of kind of school me through yeah. how to um, how to handle it. Mm-hmm. So that really helped, I okay. think. Yeah. What are what are some of the things that are influencing you or you're looking at now that doesn't necessarily have to do with the work that you're doing? I mean, your work, I, I, these are long-term projects. Mm-hmm. I don't think of anything that you do as like a short-term body of work. Mm-hmm. You see, I, as an ADD boy, like if I can put together a portfolio of 20 pictures, that's incredible, mm-hmm. you know? But I, th- I see your work kind of unfolding in, I don't want to say it's a very long, slow, complicated process. Not to say that your work is long and slow, but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you're, yeah, no, you're no. not in, you're not in a race. And for me, it takes a lot of research yeah. to, for my work. One of the other things I'm passionate about is, um, I'm not passionate about climate change. I'm passionate about people becoming more aware of mm-hmm. climate change. So for the last five years, I've been collaborating with, uh, Richard Sheridan, who's a professor in landscape architecture. Okay. And we've been um, collaborating, our students have been collaborating to do work on visualizing climate change. Okay. And we've exhibit, exhibited the work at Rhode Island Center for Photography and um, had pop up shows. Mm-hmm. And so that has been pretty amazing. Okay. And last semester, I collaborated with my colleague in music, Emmett Goods. He teaches a class on uh, music and social protest. Mm-hmm. And so my Photo One students uh, created a music video in collaboration with his students who did all mm-hmm. the research. And they created these one minute videos which just blew me away. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm gonna be teaching a class on art and uh, social protest in the fall. Oh, that's cool. And that, I mean, and that kind of ties right back to what you... Yeah, I mean, now I'm starting to make my work and yeah. what I teach really dovetail, and I'm realizing how exciting that is. Yeah, and how exciting my how excited my students were. Mm-hmm. So, did you ever feel during any of this that like I don't know what not that I don't know what I'm doing, but I don't know what the point of it all is? Not in kind of a nihilistic way, or you know, just staring into the abyss, but just the the creative process sometimes for me is. I just have to make it. I don't know what I'm doing with this. I don't feel excited about it. Or do you have a real clear idea? Like when you started the World War II project, you're like, yeah, I kind of know what this, where this is going to go. Or is it when this kind of project comes into your space, it's, well, we'll see what happens. It's more, we'll see what happens. But okay. then I research, I have maybe five ideas mm-hmm. of how to take it four of them fail okay and only one of them works out okay. so it's a lot of trial and error it's not as if it yeah you know magic happens it doesn't no, no i don't think so but i always think you know that there's a thoughtfulness to it and it, you know when do you when do you know that's and this is just for people this is about creativity i suppose is when do you know that you're onto something when I'm excited about it, I'm okay. still thinking about it after two or three days. Okay. Or uh, David and I have an argument about it, and uh, mm-hmm. and I still want to, even if he thinks it's not not going to work out, and I still believe in it, mm-hmm. then I know it's got some legs. All right. Do you ever get intimidated or a little like scared by some of the uh, the projects that you like? The most recent one. This is a lot of work. Does that intimidate you, or you're like, yeah, well, this is just what we got to do. That's that's the deal. And how do you get those funded? Or is that too private of a question? You no, know? no, I'm. I don't believe in secrets. So. Okay. Uh, I guess I love what I do. I'm mm-hmm. a workaholic, yep. and so if I have a deadline, I just work towards it. Okay. Yeah, and um, how I get things funded, I made the choice of working in academia. Mm-hmm. Um, one of its advantages is that seed money for the beginnings of projects mm-hmm. I can apply for from a research university like mm-hmm. the University of Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't have to make work that necessarily fits above my, you know, yeah. hangs in yeah. my living room. So I can um, create work that has the concepts that I've talked about mm-hmm. um, without having to worry about where my next meal is. Mm-hmm. And so that gives me a certain freedom, but yeah. also um, allows me to to try out different techniques too. Mm-hmm. So I think that you know it comes full circle where my mathematics background 
and working in computers for six years, which I hated, mm -hmm. also makes me not be intimidated by the digital toolbox. Yeah. And it allows me to, you know, if I know I want to use a technique but don't know how to do it, I'm like a dog with a bone until yeah. I figure it out because mm -hmm. I have the aptitude for that. Absolutely. And so for me, that's really exciting because then I, I'm not doing the same process again and again. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding new ways to convey the ideas that I want mm -hmm. to convey. I, re I remember we we kind of bumped into each other at the uh, Society for Photo Educators conference in Chicago. And I was I really kind of got my experience there was like this kind of feels it, it's a very insular world. What does art and academic in the academic world, especially graduate or undergraduate and graduate? What does it look like now? What, 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 do you see that? you know people going into the arts as a major or as an mfa what advice would you give or do you have any advice what, what's your what's the what does it look like now i haven't been to an spe conference in a while so well there hasn't been one for two years I'll see. <laughs> um i think today is a completely different world okay and even in um you know commercial photography you can't just be a photographer. You also need to know video mm -hmm. nowadays. It's a, you know, even making your living as a photographer is also very different oh, yeah. in today's world. And in terms of MFAs, there's a glut of MFA, yeah. people with MFAs in photography. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, academia is like a caste system yes. where they take advantage. Uh, they have a lot of part-time or adjuncts mm -hmm. and take advantage of that. And unfortunately, they don't get paid enough for what they do. Yeah. And um, and so if someone is trying to get an MFA, my question would be why? Yeah. If it is to get a teaching job, to be realistic about the kinds of teaching jobs that are out there, because mm -hmm. they're less and less that are tenure track. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are tenure track, the number of applicants and the um, qualifications of the applicants is mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, so if it's really to just create, have the time to create a portfolio of work, maybe mm -hmm. give yourself a sabbatical yeah. and give yourself time to create that. Mm -hmm. But also to surround yourselves by mentors mm -hmm. that you trust mm -hmm. to help you develop your work. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is that, um, you know, people advise me not to get an MFA. But the minute I got those three letters, opportunities changed yeah. too. So there's, there isn't one straight answer, Yeah. but I wouldn't go, I mean, the other piece of advice I would give is not to get into debt. Mm -hmm. You can go to certain graduate schools for the brand names, mm -hmm. but you're also landing yourself into a lot of debt. Yeah. There's a number of schools where you can get a free ride mm -hmm. um, and still get mentorship from your university professors, but also from outside of that. Mm -hmm. My mentors during my grad experience were outside of graduate school. Mm -hmm. That's just, I mean, because I toyed with it, you know, I have an undergraduate undergraduate degree in anthropology and I kind of floundered around in Cincinnati. I didn't know what I was. I knew I loved photography at that mm -hmm. point. And I was working as a custom printer in a commercial lab. And I so all my skills were really very mechanical mm -hmm. and technical. Um, and I didn't know how I was going to do it until I landed at the New England School of Photography. Mm hmm. And that was right at the end of the uh, 96 or so. And so just as I was graduating, digital was kind of coming in. So all the things that I really knew solidly and I really loved uh, were becoming a little obsolete or not important. And I, did, I didn't want to. So I, I toyed with the idea, of, well, I should go to graduate school. And my dad was like, no, I don't think you should. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, don't th I think you're done with school. So I was like, okay. And it's, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I didn't. And so it's because seeing the academic world, and you know, I love teaching, I, I, I do, and I taught at NESOP for a while, uh, and I still do little workshops here and there. I love teaching, but it just seems like there's so much, like you said, there is a glut of people out there working for nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it, you know, that's really too bad. I mean, it's, it's tragic mm -hmm. in some ways, but on the other side of it is like, because now that I have a daughter who's interested in the arts and wanting to go to school for it, it's like, well, I don't know what that looks like. Well, I have an answer for that. It hit me. I strong, especially because of my undergraduate in mathematics, mm -hmm. I have a strong, and I, I would also mention I was a director of the humanities at University of Rhode yes. Island. 
I have a strong belief in the liberal arts and yeah. the skills that they teach you. Mm -hmm. If a student goes, I mean, no one at that age really knows what they want to do, or very few people do. I didn't. So if you go on a career professional degree, you're mm -hmm. stuck with doing that for the rest of your life. Yeah. And you'd be unhappy as I was in India, not mm -hmm. wanting to get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the skills that a liberal arts degree teaches you mm -hmm. in terms of creative thinking, problem solving, mm -hmm. and numerous other things um, allows you to have a a, a whole range of jobs mm -hmm. and also especially in the 21st century you're not going to be having one job for the rest of your life yeah so as you move along those same skills are applicable mm -hmm. and make you much more flexible and than someone who's done nursing and decides they don't want to be a nurse anymore yeah so i'm a i i think undergraduate is a time to explore and experiment with mm -hmm. all types of majors and that the american system allows that mm -hmm. And so you'll find things you really like. You'll develop skills as you go along. And you can think about a career later on. Yeah. So I'm for all for the arts. That's what I told her. So oh, I'll good. say Anu said this, and good. she's smarter than me. Uh, the book is um, is being done with Minor Matters Publishing. Okay. Sorry, Minor Matter Books and my gallery, CPI. Mm -hmm. And their publishing model is that you pre-sell 500 books. Mm -hmm. Um, so that it pays for the expenses for it to go into production mm -hmm. uh, versus an, a lot of other photo publishing where you have to take 30000 to the table, which yeah. I was not willing to do. No. And and so I'm in the midst of that. I'm up to, I think, 375. Mm -hmm. So I've only got 125 copies more to sell. And I'm hoping some of your listeners will uh, we, buy it. We will put them. a link in the show notes and everything. Absolutely. Oh, no, yeah. I, that was... That was actually the motivation to get you to talk. Is it okay? You have something to actually promote. Uh -huh. So, what's in the book? So, one of the interesting things is I sent all the a lot of images mm -hmm. to the publisher, and I love how a good publisher or a good curator r looks at it from a different point of view, a different perspective, and recontextualizes it. Mm -hmm. And so what she sent back to me was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. All right. And to explain that, uh, she and actually it goes back to Anderson Ranch. Mm -hmm. I had I was in England for two or three months when David was teaching there right after graduate school. Mm -hmm. So similar to Memories of England, India, I thought I'll do Memories of England because mm -hmm. I grew up there, was sure. born there. And I photographed with the Holger this time in color. Mm -hmm. But when I came back to the residency and I looked at the images, um, the, my only connection to England is really my father who had died at that point, maybe I think 20 years, 22 mm -hmm. years ago. So I decided to make a little handmade book of um, called Fabrications of the Truth. And what mm -hmm. I did is I took the images that I created and scanned some family photographs mm -hmm. again and inserted these family photographs into the into the images I had just created. Mm -hmm. So they looked like memories of my childhood but didn't actually exist. Mm. And then I put those onto Polaroid, okay. uh, which I made Polaroid transfers and put okay. those onto very fragile uh, Japanese paper book. Mm -hmm. And the book was had was covered with tobacco paper and put into a Chesterfield box because okay. my father died from complications from smoking. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the publisher took one of the images from that book, which was not really meant for exhibitions. It was meant, yeah. you know, to commemorate my father's 25th death anniversary. Mm -hmm. And she put that on the cover because in the end, all the stories I'm telling of other communities mm -hmm. are stories that relate to trauma, not being stories that are not being told mm -hmm. and have given me the skills to maybe listen and interview other people. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it all connects, but I had never seen that yeah. connection till now. And so to me, that really was wonderful. The other thing that I'm excited about in terms of the book is we haven't uh, announced the writers yet, but mm -hmm. there'll be two writers who will, again, give more context or more depth to the work. Because mm -hmm. as you said, the work has different layers. Yeah, oh. And we'll address those different layers. One of the uh, writers is going to be an indigenous mm -hmm. writer to also write from their perspective of how they view viewed the work that they've seen over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Jack Nicholson made this great, th this great quote from Jack Nicholson of all people. 
who says having children gives your life a depth and dimension that you wouldn't otherwise have. And I think the same thing could be said about experience, a trauma, mm. a loss, whatever. And when you talked about how the experience of your father passing has allowed you, has opened up doors that probably wouldn't be available to you in a, any other way. I just, mm -hmm. that kind of really resonated with me. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense that like, you know, you, it allows you to establish a connection with people, especially when you're talking about, you know, with World War II veterans or people who are no longer here, how that kind of, you're not being exploitive. You're trying to connect Does it, or balance, if we want to use a mathematical term, balance the equation. Well, I mean, another project was about part, the partition of British India, which mm -hmm. became India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And I collected the stories of the children of partition, mm -hmm. both in India and in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And so for Pakistanis to tell me what my countrymen had done to them, you, you know, it took a lot of trust yeah. for them to do that. And, um, and so, yeah, it is amazing how people just open up with these stories. Yeah. That reminds me, my, my best friend's father is Pakistani, and there was a period of time where they lived in Peshawar. Mm -hmm. And and he was talking about just like, and that was back in the 70s when things were a little tense back there, and just like, yeah, air raids and bombing. And I was, and I was like, dude, that's traumatic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you, you lived in a war zone. Yeah. Like, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's, you know, just sort of, and, uh, you know, he's a well-adjusted, balanced human being and all that, you know, but just kind of like how that almost, and, but he's also really, really sensitive and thoughtful. And I mean, he's an actor and, you know, just, it is interesting how that kind of, and, and the work that you talk about a lot is kind of this, a slow burn trauma in the sense that like it, it was, it's a very intimate thing, but it's also a cultural thing like what mm -hmm. what the white people did to the native americans in this country i mean like you said also it is complicated but for the most part it was pretty horrible mm -hmm. you know and i think and just like you know not all british people were awful um but just the sensibility of we are up here and they are down there and just kind of like overlooking stuff that is so that it's kind of like this huge trauma but kind of making it the personal without it you were going to say something just i was going to say that's exactly what my work is about okay yeah <laughs> winner winner chicken dinner <laughs> all right no and, that, and that's that's amazing and, and that's something that that's tough and it, it takes a lot of um you got to be open to it in a lot of ways i mean that's it because it, it is easy to overlook and it is easy to kind of get lost in the technical or whatever um but that's really and that's still it's it's never going to be irrelevant mm, because we're mm -hmm. still doing that we still do that all the time i mean you know open up the news i don't i don't read the news mm -hmm. really i mean i i read the headlines and i'm not living in a bubble but it's really rough to see how the other is we it's almost like we need the other and i'd love to live in a world where we don't that's so true i mean we do it. I mean, we continue to. It's like this cycle. Yeah. That keeps going. Yeah. All right. So, but we can't end on that note. Tell me some good news. Do you, do you got a good joke? Do you got something? What? How did you? I'll, I'll tell you something that I think is. It's not about me, actually. Okay. That's it's perfect. about my students. All right. Um, you know, this whole Ukraine war is going on. It's. Mm -hmm. It was like the elephant in the room while teaching. Yeah. So one class I said I want to address the elephant in the room and mm -hmm. one of my students said I'm half Ukrainian half Russian mm -hmm. and everyone said oh my god mm -hmm. so I came back the next week and I said let's do something about it Th this these are photo one students mm -hmm. I said why don't you donate your images for a fundraiser mm -hmm. and we'll ask the student's mother for suggestions of um places to donate the money mm -hmm. and six or seven of them agreed and they raised over a thousand two hundred dollars jeez and i am very proud of them that's awesome yeah well that's something i mean with technology and the kids kids these days they're able to just we do it yeah yeah you know and that and that's why i have faith in this generation mm -hmm. is that they uh, you know my daughter she's 17 she has grown up in a completely connected world for the mm -hmm. most part, she's, you know, cell phones, smartphones have just been part of the life and the communities 
that they that kind of spring up around it they just there's always going to be an opportunity to kind of get into a silo but it almost is like it their generation is just going over those walls you know and the communities that are forming around the world with the transgenders or you know anything any of the others are finding all the others and becoming a, a community yeah and also going back to photography and what a person should do today frankly the social media and the internet mm -hmm. i mean that's the whole thing that is still being mined in yeah. ways we can't even imagine oh, yeah. for making a living mm -hmm. and um and the next this generation is going to have jobs that we haven't even thought about it's an exciting time yeah it is exciting so anu will you ever forgive me for not seeing your show with a new <laughs> I will forgive you. You bought my book. So, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I'll buy it again. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, the 10th person to like this video or podcast will get a, a free, a new book. Thank you very much for your time and your patience. Thank you. I enjoyed it. It's always fun to see you. Same here. All right. Take care. <laughs>